So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I have to say, just catching a bit of the panel discussion there, it was really encouraging to see that there was uh, talk of standards and uh, making uh, negative data accessible. And I certainly echo my uh, colleague at the FDA's view uh, of, of the way this should proceed. So I was just going to tell you about some of the things and some of the pressures that we're putting on you from, from the National Institutes of Health uh, with respect to uh, really open science, uh, which of course includes uh, the knowledge that appears in the literature, but also uh, the data and actually procedures and many other aspects. So uh, let me just say that, uh, you know, this is really just our mission statement. It's about the pursuit of fundamental knowledge and the nature of behavior of living things um, and the application of that knowledge to improve uh, health care uh, and reduce disability. I mean, this is apple hood and mother pie, but you can't really do this, frankly, uh, I think, in the opinion of um, most people at the NIH without uh, really having open science. And there's no question, I report directly to Francis Collins, the director of NIH, that we're we're all over this as, as much as we can be. But I think it's already been alluded to, but let me just drive it home a bit more. Uh, there are different viewpoints, and I think, you know, Daniel Meachin's here with me, uh, who works with me on these, these issues around open science. We've been around the block with this for many years, and different elements, different communities have very different views uh, about open science, and even within the biomedical uh, sciences, of course, there's quite a lot of uh, variation in how people think about it, and you, you see that in various forms. I think a major driver right now uh, is coming from the cancer moonshot and uh, Joe Biden's uh, sort of realization uh, of, of what goes on in science. I think it's fair to say that uh, when he really started digging into this, uh, he realized that he was it was incredulous to him that scientists didn't already share their data uh, and protocols and so on uh, throughout the uh, discovery process. And then the further revelation is that scientists actually have to buy back their own work to, to read it, uh, I think is, was quite incredulous to him. And there's quite strong pushes coming from the White House uh, to, to uh, change that situation. And then, of course, there was this whole hoo-ha that went on um, Con, uh, concerning the uh, editorial that appeared in the, the Nash, uh, in, um, New England Journal of Medicine concerning data parasites. And I'm not going to sort of belabor that anymore. But it just shows that there are different opinions in all of this. Um, and, you know, there are good, there's good rationale for some of the things uh, in this context. But I, I've sort of, I have to say, this is not necessarily the exact words of the NIH, but I, I've sort of drawn it from a couple of places, uh, particularly as it relates to data sharing, more generalized it somewhat. But I think it, it, it really emphasizes what we're really trying to do. Scientific output, data, software, resources, papers should be made as widely and freely accessible as possible while safeguarding the privacy of participants and protecting confidential and proprietary information. So clearly there, is, there are some sort of tensions in that um, that come up in this, but notwithstanding, this is the general uh, approach that uh, we believe in and we're following uh, through policies and then applications of those policies, which I'll tell you a little about. So I think part of this, of course, stems from past successes. So this is actually a picture from the Bermuda Accord uh, when in the very early days of the Human Genome Project, it was determined that <coughs> sequencing information was going to be made available uh, essentially immediately after it was collected as part of that project. That was fairly unprecedented in science at the time. And I think people look back on that now, and this is an article that came out recently in Nature, that <coughs> reflects uh, the 20 or 25 years since then. Um, and, you know, I think there's no question that there's been, and I, you know, you only have to go, for example, to the plant and animal genomics meeting, uh, which is this vibrant meeting with lots of commercial enterprise associated with it, to see how uh, a massive industry has emerged uh, from, in part, of course, the openness of the, the, inf the data that, that was collected as part of the human genome and the many other genomic projects that have gone on and continue to go on. And now, of course, it's all about genotyping of individuals. Uh, and that is happening at a very rapid rate. Currently, NCBI at the NIH has about 20 petabytes of data. 
Uh, it, that could alone increase by 10 petabytes this year just predominantly from genotyping information. Uh, raw reads pre predominantly, of course. So there's a lot of uh, information becoming available and, you know, and, and the not desire to share it. So I'm just going to sort of go over a few of the things that uh, have happened uh, around this culture of sharing uh, that sort of actually even predates the Genome Project. Uh, but first of all, just to give you a little lineage of what's going on and then just sort of describe where we're headed. Um, and I'd much prefer to, rather than having me waffle on about this, I'd be very interested to get your viewpoints and have a dialogue because I'm not, I haven't worked very much with this community and I have this responsibility across the NIH to work with a large variety of communities. So clearly NIH has a culture sharing, it's been there for a long time and let's start part way down the timeline as it relates to GWAS studies. Um, so there was a, uh, you know, a, a GWAS policy statement that came out uh, a number of years ago. Uh, that then led to the development of dbGaP, uh, the genotype to phenotype data resource. And I'd be the first to admit there are some uh, significant issues with all of that. I think, first of all, getting, uh, getting stuff into it <laughs> and getting stuff out of it. Uh, but notwithstanding, that is uh, a resource that was set up to capture this information. And there's quite a lot of work going on with respect to dbGaP to improve what I just described. Uh, but that was sort of a, a guiding principle that occurred early, and it's clearly had an impact. Uh, this is the uh, requests, the, you know, the request process is not perfect by any means, it's got better, but clearly uh, there is, you know, significant interest and it's growing uh, to access data from dbGaP. Moving on um, to the sort of uh, public access policy, uh, this has been, uh, I think this was uh, very much the work of uh, many people around the NIH, but particularly driven by Harold Varmus when he was the director of NIH, which accumulated too in, in development of organizations like the Public Library of Science, um, which I'm partic particularly uh, proud to say that I was part of, having founded one of their journals, uh, PLOS Computational Biology, a number of years ago, or co-founded. Um, and so, you know, the, the general notion is that it was the creation of PubMed Central um, and, the, um, and so that uh, the, the notion that uh, the investigators that were funded by the NIH had to make uh, their full access to their publication within 12 months uh, after publication uh, within PubMed Central. And of course, that's grown enormously and access to it has grown enormously. Uh, including, this is just a paper that was from the last, uh, no, one of the last Nobel laureates that were announced, uh, showing that the, their, their papers are open access. In fact, we're now going beyond that. Um, we're now moving into the realm of preprints. So preprints are uh, very uh, well used in other fields, particularly fields like astronomy and physics. Uh, and so it's the notion that the moment a piece of work is finished, uh, that public or that pre-publication, that preprint, uh, is deposited in an archive where people have access to it. And then what happens? It's this is pre-review, and then 80, in the case of physics and the archive, for example, 80% of that content uh, that goes into archive ultimately finds its way into the published literature. But it does so uh, essentially where the published literature is really the copy of record. But people get access to that content six to nine, I've emphasized unreviewed content, six to nine months ahead, uh, perhaps more, as I'm sure you've all had experiences with papers that take forever to get published. Uh, and so we're at the NIH very interested in this because uh, it would actually put information out there. And we can pull levers to facilitate preprint uh, adoption. So there is bioarchive uh, and other journals uh, in biomedicine who support preprints already, PJ, uh, PLOS one's moving in this, or PLOS in general is moving in this direction, um, and F1000 and so on. And so we're, we're, be, we're getting behind this. And you, know, you can expect to see uh, statements that encourage within grant applications uh, and within uh, progress reports that, uh, that, cite, that citing preprints uh, is uh, an accepted uh, practice. And, you can, uh, and that, first of all, I think uh, will facilitate, but it also makes to the reviewer, it actually provides access to uh, 
uh, papers that perhaps would not otherwise be available as part of that process because they haven't yet been published and yet now they can be considered as part of that grant application. You can argue that there's plus and minuses to this system. There's a group called ASAP Bio that's been, uh, this is community driven, that has been looking at this in some detail uh, and there's a general consensus I would say within the community to move these things forward uh, and move preprints forward and we're, we're behind that. So that's just another aspect of the whole publication piece. Um, moving on, this, as was mentioned, what I'm responsible for, which is the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. Uh, data sharing is something that we're uh, constantly working on uh, within, within the NIH, and I encourage you to look for the requests for information that come out about that, because that really is how things get shaped. Um, I've only been a Fed for t a little over two years, so uh, before that I was a PI for many years, and. I'm quite incredulous at the amount of effort that goes in in getting community input into these things. And I would definitely encourage you to, uh, to participate in RFIs when, when you see them that relate to things that are relevant to your science. Um, and particularly, of course, I'm interested in you doing that with respect to the ones that relate to open science, of which there are a number. Uh, Preprints is an example of one of them. Uh, there's, there's other about data citation. So, one of the aspects of all of this that we're working on is the idea is, and I'll say this more as a personal view, but I think the, the theme about what I'm going to say, I think permeates the NIH, is that right now scholarship is, is pretty broken. What we value in scholarship are not necessarily the right things. Uh, when folks come up for tenure, it's all about one word journal papers. It's not necessarily about important reference data sets that they've cherished and put forward into the community. It's not necessarily, in most cases, about software that they've, uh, that they've developed that's used heavily by the community, which are incredibly valuable tools of scholarship which just don't get their fair rating. We're in the process of trying to address that uh, and you'll see an RFI very soon associated with data uh, and, re and software and resource citation. So again, it's the idea along the lines of preprints that we're going to encourage that uh, investigators include references and cite data formally. And there are mechanisms for doing this. Uh, and then you can imagine then that data sets become part of the, uh, the citation network and you can use it to navigate so you can actually find uh, you might find a paper that has a, a relevant data set to what you're doing and you'll be able to find all, in principle, all other papers that have actually referenced that data set or used that data set in some way. So uh, you can make these arguments for software and, and other resources as well. So that, uh, that's coming and uh, another part of all of this is the, the data, um, data management plans. Right now we have a situation where any grant, any NIH grant of over $500,000 a year direct uh, has to have a data management plan. I have to say, when I, when I find that uh, frankly quite ridiculous, it's basically saying if you only have a small grant, you're not, you're not generating any data that deserves a plan, uh, which to me doesn't make any sense. That will change. Uh, you can expect to see data management plans on all grants. NSF have had this for some time, but I think it's fair to say that this doesn't necessarily work very well. Uh, and I think we really need to improve uh, the way that we uh, use those plans for the benefit of the community at large. So in other words, you can right now, you could pretty much write any plan you wanted and no one would really pay that much attention to it, uh, the truth be told. Uh, that is, it will change. Uh, it will become part, a formal part of the review process. Uh, it will be expected to be commented on in the review process. And it ties into this notion that you were discussing in the panel about standards. So the idea, if you're going to state that you're going to produce data um, at a certain time point in this, in this grant and it's going to uh, be deposited somewhere in repository uh, X, uh, then that also ought to be standardized if such standards exist. If standards don't exist, we at the NIH should be helping you uh, facilitate as a community those standards um, and we are very interested in doing that and I'll be happy to talk to you more about that if that's of interest. But those plans, the irony of those plans of course is right now they're in no way machine readable. So one of the notions we're working on is the idea that they will be machine readable so we can automatically detect 
uh, when data is going to go into a repository uh, in, in, uh, and that we can then go to that repository in principle and we're implementing this already within N NCBI. Uh, so the grant numbers will be associated with the data depositions and we'll be able to see whether that data is there. Now there may be very legitimate reasons that when you start a grant you say, oh, uh, I'm going to put this data on, you know, in repository on a, a certain time point and it doesn't go there because, you know, as we know, research never goes as planned. Um, but it's, it behooves us to ask the questions. And so I think it's just another example where we're elevating the value of data within the enterprise. Um, and you know, I, we can talk about the quality of the data and, and the description of that data and metadata, and of course all of that's important. And we need to reward the people who spend time doing that. So it probably sounds a bit like a diet. I feel like I'm on a soapbox. I talk about this all the time and I really uh, think it's really important. So there's the, and of course we're promoting this through the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, and I could certainly talk to you more about that if you want. Uh, so in fact, so there's various uh, aspects of BD2K that really are supporting this, including we're in the process, in fact, as soon as I go here, I'm going to the multi-council working group, which is the council that oversees the BD2K initiative, uh, where we're going to present some concepts that move the whole notion of what we're calling the commons forward. So the commons is a virtual shared space uh, where, uh, that we're establishing to support. It's all very well saying you need to do this, and of course there are established repositories for a lot of data, but there's also lots of data, including negative data, for example, where currently there is no uh, repositories. So you know, we need at least to ex begin experimenting uh, in a small way with pilots, alternatives, uh, to, frankly, the current repository system, which is very siloed, into uh, what we're calling the commons, which is this shared uh, open virtual space. Uh, and I could go into a lot more detail about what that means, but um, BD2K is pushing forward initiatives to actually evaluate how well uh, this, this can work. And it's tied quite closely to, uh, at least initially, to either public or private clouds, because clouds is, you know, offer this sort of technological uh, t uh, test bed to, uh, to try out these things. And it turns out that the, uh, f the major public cloud providers, namely Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, are all anxious to play in this game, because we don't know how much we spend on data at NIH, but I can tell you uh, just at rough estimates, it's probably uh, well over a billion dollars a year. Um, and that's only, you know, one thirty-second of, of the NIH's budget, but it's still a lot of money. And um, there's, there's interest in having that money spent better, and certainly there's interest in the private sector to uh, actually share in those, uh, in those riches. So I could go on about that for a long time as well, but I won't. Let me just say something that's perhaps more closely aligned with your own uh, thinking, uh, which is, first of all, perhaps not so much, but so certainly to some degree. So uh, ju we've just we put out a more extensive genome data sharing policies. That's, those are out. Those are now uh, need to be complied with uh, as part of uh, grant applications. And uh, this is sort of a, and it's, it started pretty much the beginning of this year, and that's ongoing. And you can expect, as other types of data uh, you know, the maturity of other types of data, these policies will be extended to cover these other kinds of data. And I won't go into the details of that and the scope of it, but um, uh, that's all pretty well laid out uh, by the NIH already. Um, and I'd say that there are organizations, and, uh, and there are you know, certainly foundations we just heard from, but also uh, the community writ large through organizations like the Global uh, Alliance for Genomic Health who are pushing in the same direction for these things. So, you know, the NIH is not doing this willy-nilly. They're doing it because they believe that's what the community uh, ultimately really wants. And uh, clearly there's, uh, there's efforts around uh, GA4, GH, if you're f familiar with it, uh, that is pushing in the same directions around uh, data sharing. And certainly they're working with us quite closely in this commons concept, for example. So finally, let me just say a little uh, about clinical trials um, and the, the moderni modernization of the clinical trial system. 
So the revelation came uh, several years ago when it was realized that after 60 months, only f about 50% of trials were actually reported. Um, and this, this sort of sent uh, a wave through the, uh, the NIH. And there was a, a very significant effort, both in terms of policy and with respect to clinicaltrials.gov, to actually improve this situation. And uh, Kathy Hudson and uh, Francis Collins wrote a letter, uh, wrote, sorry, a, uh, a commentary about what was going to happen here uh, in terms of the modernization of, the, of clinical trials activities. Uh, it was essentially about improving transparency um, and, uh, and, and, and creating policies to better support uh, so that clinical trial information, initially summary information, but then ultimately uh, individual participant information uh, would uh, at some, you know, obviously with appropriate protections be accessible. Uh, this is, oops, sorry, let me go back. This is, uh, this is led, and I actually was trying to, I'm sorry I didn't get before I came here today, uh, whether this is, uh, this is actually, there's a, there was a notice of proposed rulemaking, um, and I'm not quite sure exactly where that stands right now. I was trying to check this morning, I apologize, but uh, certainly the intent is that the future requirements will be registration of all, of all phase two, three, and four trials. Um, perhaps people in the audience can comment and know more about it right now. Uh, and that will also extend to phase one. So I'd say that there's, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of policy making, uh, there's support through improvements to clinicaltrials.gov uh, to uh, facilitate the, the the registration and management of trial information, um, which obviously costs an enormous amount of money, and ha only having 50% of the trial information available after you know, uh, a, a long period of time after the trial is completed is really not appropriate when the NIH is paying for it, at least part of it. So that's, that's under consideration. So I'll stop there, and I would be happy to try and answer any questions you have about uh, what the NIH is trying to do in promoting open science. So thanks very much. Everybody's quite satisfied, I guess. Is there any experience with posting of preprints having a chilling effect on the ultimate publication in high impact journals? So there is a, a Wikipedia page which you can go to which describes how publishers and then journals within each publishing house uh, in biomedicine view uh, preprints. And I, I think it's fair to say that um, there is uh, large support for it. Uh, in other words, that the majority of journals uh, will uh, still publish in high impact journals um, even after the preprint is there. And I think uh, Science recently announced that they were, that they're supporting this. Um, so, you know, I, and as I said already, 80% of, uh, in, in physics, and uh, we're, we would anticipate the same would happen in biomedicine, that 80% of these things would get published in regular journals anyway. Um, but they would be made accessible more, more, more readily. I mean, I'll speak some per, somewhat personally about this, is that I actually uh, don't like the, the term at all, high impact journals. Um, and I, I really wish, and we're actually doing some efforts in this way to educate particularly uh, academic administrators about what impact means. I mean, being in, you know, obviously there's some correlation, but there are many high impact papers which are not in high impact journals. And we really need to be, it's, it's, it's not good for a situation when someone goes up for tenure and they, the reviewers scan through and see what science, nature and cell papers they have and that becomes a defining feature. This is, I'm making a personal statement here. Uh, they really need to look into the metrics of what has happened with those papers and what impact they've had. Um, irrespective of where they're published. And I think the tools to do that are, are becoming more and more available. And we, we, we all should be encouraging that, in my opinion, that kind of behavior. So that the work it stands on its true merits, not where it happens to be published. 
sorry, that was a bit of a diatribe. Just anecdotally, we've had an experience where an important paper could have been published in the Journal of Neurosurgery three months, in three months, but the investigator, in order to accelerate his promotion, wanted to have it published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which delayed the dissemination of those results almost 18 months. Yeah, I think I'm actually aware of that specific case, but um, and perhaps there are just because maybe there's just lots of other cases of that. Yeah, I mean, that 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 is really a problem, and um, you know, I think you know there is, I've, I've come to believe really one of the reasons I went to work at the NIH is because there's really two levers. There's the lever at the point of publication, and there's the lever at the point of funding, and uh, you you know. It'd be nice if those levers were pulled together, uh, but <laughs> that doesn't, we've actually made efforts to try and have that happen. Uh, in other words, that for example, data sharing policies from journals be brought into alignment with both with each other and with what the, fed, what the federal, uh, what the funding agencies worldwide are asking for. Of course, all that's very complicated. Um, but you know, you can, some of that is, there's at least some willingness to do all of that. So I think we're, you know, we're moving, things are moving in, in, in the right directions. And, um, and, you know, I think when you, and it's partly a generational thing, um, and I think we're seeing uh, the, the new generations more embracing of open science in general, and I, to me all of that's a good sign.